Medistand. Understanding Medicine. Hi, I am Professor Azizur Rahman, and today we are going to take up another topic in ECG. And if you are attending my earlier videos, we have covered many topics. Uh, we have gone through all these, and the last one was ectopics, atrial, junctional, and ventricular. And this time we're going to cover this supraventricular tachycardias. This is a actually a group of disorders and uh, collectively called supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, any tachycardia which arises above a bundle of his, this would include SA node, it would include AV node, and it would also include any potential pacemaker in the atrium. So any rhythm, any tachycardia which arises from this part above bundle of his would be called supraventricular tachycardia. Why this group? Because this would cause typically narrow complexes, the normal narrow complexes, unless there is some coexisting condition or pre-existing condition. Like for example, somebody has a right bundle brand block or left bundle brand block. There is a reason to have broad complexes. Even sinus rhythm would be broad complex. So supraventricular tachycardia will also be a broad complex. But otherwise, uh, these patients would have narrow complex tachycardias. This is further classified into regular tachycardias, SVTs, or also I think atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation technically are supraventricular tachycardia, but they are classified as separate entities and we will cover them in separate video. Today we will cover this supraventricular tachycardia, the commonest type. My affiliation. Now this is a broad classification of tachyarrhythmias. Uh, supraventricular tachycardia we are talking about. Supraventricular sinus tachycardia, uh, this may be purely physiological condition, like everybody during exercise gets tachycardia, during fever, during anxiety gets tachycardia, and you remember when you are waiting for your turn in the examination, you get tachycardia. Uh, so I think that is sinus tachycardia, although there is a condition that is called inappropriate sinus tachycardia, there may be it's fast-hearted without any physiological stresses. That may be a morbid condition. Then there's a condition called paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias. Now, why do we call it paroxysmal? Because it typically comes in attacks. Patient may be absolutely fine, asymptomatic, and any moment, it could be any moment, patient may be sleeping, patient may be waking, patient may be bathing, patient may be doing anything, any moment, sometimes due to some triggering factor and sometimes without any known triggering factor, patient develops severe tachycardia, which is in the range of uh, around 200 plus. 150 figure is very critical because sinus tachycardia, in sinus tachycardia, usually the resting heart rate does not exceed 150. Of course, there are exceptions. During exercise, your heart rate could go up to like 190, 200. But during a resting condition, in case of a sinus tachycardia, heart rate is usually less than 150. If it is more than 150 and about 250 or less than 250, it may be paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. I'm going to discuss the detail later. Then atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. In these two, the heart rate is maybe 250 plus up to 350 and 350 plus up to 450. So I think these are separate conditions. We'll take up, uh, take them up in separate videos. Very similar tachycardia could develop from the AV node that is called junctional tachycardia. When you casually see the ECG, this might look just like supraventricular tachycardia, but when you examine it in detail, you might find some subtle differences we will emphasize in videos. Then most dreaded is the ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia is actually a manifestation of underlying heart disease. Either somebody has existing coronary artery disease, or this may be the first manifestation of acute coronary syndrome, or patient may be predisposed due to some QT prolongation or some other predisposed condition. 
or it may be just idiopathic somebody doesn't have any problem at all and just from nowhere this ventricular tachycardia comes even if the rates may be similar but ventricular tachycardia is inherently much more serious we will have a separate video on ventricular tachycardia also now let me show you this ecg and uh, let me have your input if suppose this patient doesn't have much of symptoms suppose this is a young person and this is the ecg now if you scan you know whenever you comment on tachycardia bradycardia or arrhythmia you need to examine the rhythm step and this is the rhythm step in this case so if you examine from this side and go to this side more or less the same you have narrow complexes you have every qrs complex is preceded with p wave you see just this see this one there is a p wave there is a p wave there is a p wave so p waves are there complexes are narrow but heart rate is clearly i think you can clearly tell just by inspecting the strip that heart rate is faster and there is some some change in morphology in qrs complex at least the, uh, the amplitude this could be little what we call qrs alternance something like that but if you see the other leads, the just the all leads, lead one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, I don't see much of problem. At least no no infarction or any other major issue. Okay, so what's the heart rate here? There are nine small squares in between two adjacent R waves, and RRs are regular. So if RR are regular and you count the number of small square between two any any two adjacent rr you can calculate the heart rate so this one is 1500 divided by 9 is 166 you remember 1500 figure actually 1500 is the number of small squares per minute since we want to calculate heart rate per minute so 166 is the heart rate so i think it is clearly more than 150 and otherwise it is just like sinus tachycardia so i think i would call it sinus tachycardia it may be svt also but i know that this is actually sinus tachycardia okay there may be high fever there may be hyperthyroidism or there may be some anxiety state uh, no other serious problem let's take another example now What about this one? This is again sinus tachycardia. The heart rate calculated is 115. Otherwise, you can see absolutely normal. Uh, this is not a rhythm step, but wherever you see all these segments, there is absolutely regular PQRS, PQRS, PQRS. So this is another example of sinus tachycardia. In this case, the heart rate is less. Although, by definition, any rate which is more than 100 is tachycardia. Now, I'm going to take up this very, very interesting uh, condition called uh, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Okay, now there are classification, there are two types. This uh, shows that in both of them, the phenomenon, underlying phenomenon is called re entry. Now, what is a re entry circuit in the heart? maybe in the AV node, this is AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. So in this case, this re-entry would be within the AV node or this is uh, atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia. In this case, the re-entry cycle is outside the AV node because of the uh, anomalous pathway, maybe bundle of Kent. One of the limb may be AV node, the other is a bundle of Kent. So in both of them, there is re-entry. I'm going to explain to you how this re-entry develops and how this precipitates tachycardia. So let's take up this one first. The common one. This is much more common in 90% of the cases. If you have a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, in 90% of the cases, it would be AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. Now, this is an example. If you see, I think without any much effort you appreciate one thing very very quickly that heart rate is very fast 
if you see the rhythm step it is very very fast and I'll just display the actual heart rate but you know that heart rate is very fast number two it is regular just concentrate on R waves or S waves these peaks I think you can appreciate that they it's very very regular now what do you think is it broad or is it narrow it might look broad because this uh, there is because uh, some part of ST segment is actually merging with uh, QRS but if you just see the QRS let's just see this one if you just see the QRS it is narrow so it is fast it is regular it is narrow everything is suggestive of supraventricular tachycardia so heart rate is 250 i calculated if you want to do it yourself you can calculate here from number of small squares 1500 divided by number of small squares between 2 rr would be 250 in this case so very very fast more than what you would expect in sinus tachycardia and complexes are narrow see this one this if you see these s waves they are narrow they narrow means not broad so another condition fulfilled and number three p waves are not visible in sinus tachycardia you expect p wave to be seen before every qrs complex just in the previous example in this case there is no p wave not that there is no uh, there is no atrial depolarization in svts there is atrial depolarization but since it is av nodal phenomenon mostly so atria depolarize at the same time when the ventricles depolarize so p wave is actually merged in in the qrs complex you don't see p wave as a separate entity although in some cases you may be able to see a p wave just before the qrs or just after the qrs but mostly it is merged in qrs and you won't see it and it is regular so all the features have been highlighted the diagnosis should be now very easy it is i, th I think there's one more observation that is st depression now why is st depression is that part of supraventricular tachycardia no it is not the integral part of supraventricular tachycardia but since heart beat is 250 which is more than i think it is almost triple the normal heart rate so anybody's heart if it is beating three times its usual rate it could develop ischemia particularly if there is already underlying coronary artery disease so you never know this patient may not have any symptoms of coronary artery disease patient may be young but with this heart rate of 250 there may be secondary ischemic changes and this may indicate underlying coronary artery disease so i think this would indicate presence of st depression in svt would indicate the urgency of treatment if there is no st depression maybe it is not that urgent but presence of st depression would probably indicate the urgency of treatment so this is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia with ischemia with second ischemia okay this has to be differentiated from ventricular tachycardia and i'll show you how to do that and if there is difficulty sometime svt could resemble vt supraventricular tachycardia could be broad complex also now let me tell you those three conditions where svt may be broad complex number one when there is pre-existing left or right bundle branch block right because the sinus uh, beats are broad svt would also be broad number two when because of the fast heart rate there is transient functional right or left bundle branch block during tachycardia this is called aberrant conduction so and that is another another example the third one is a person who has pre-excitation syndrome there is an anomalous pathway between atria and ventricle part of the current is passing through and there are actually two types of tachycardia in that also one of them could be broad complex so there are situations where supraventricular tachycardia may be broad complex but vt is always broad complex i'll show you a list of features differentiating one from the two but one lesson i like to give you here is in case it is difficult for you to differentiate 
treat it as VT because VT has much more serious consequences. So I hope this was clear SVT with secondary ischemia. What are the criteria? Heart rate is fast around 200 plus 250 around regular and narrow. Narrow only if the otherwise patient had narrow complexes. I just should, told you three examples where SVT could be broad complexes. ST depression if there is secondary ischemia and usually history of similar attacks. Now these patients they are prone. This could of course be first attack of that individual but typically these patients they have repeated uh, attacks and this may be first documented attack and patient might give you history of attacks of palpitation. So I think if that is the case, it would be typical SVT. I hope this was clear. Now this is another example. What do you say? Let's examine this lead, the rhythm strip. One thing, it is fast, number very sure, it is very, very fast. Not exactly as fast as the previous one, but fast. Number two, regular. Number three, QRS complexes are narrow. Number four, there are no ST depression, so no ischemic changes. But there is a difference, one difference between this one and the previous one. If you examine, if you examine this part, let me see if I can magnify. I'm not sure if I can magnify it. If, if you see this part, you see a small upward deflection here after, after the QRS complex. So you actually see a small slur here also. You can see a small notch after the QRS complex. Maybe you can magnify it on your screen and you would appreciate that there is a small notch following a QRS complex. This is actually a P wave. Now this may very well be a case of SVT or it could be a case of junctional tachycardia. Many SVTs are also actually junctional, but this is the one where you could see the P wave also. The heart rate is 150 beats per minute. And let's scan this and you will appreciate. Uh, I'm just moving this magnifier. It's just a symbolic magnifier. It's not magnifying actually, but there you will see areas where you see the notch following a QRS complex. They are very narrow and regular. So all the features of SVT, it is actually SVT, but not paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. It is, I think, junctional tachycardia or maybe supraventricular tachycardia. You can't tell actually. So I told you in paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, you could see a P wave before or after QRS complex. In this case, it is after, but in majority, you do not see P wave because P wave is usually merged in QRS complex as was the case in the previous ECT. So this is another example of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Now this is the strip. If you examine this part, it is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Yeah, see, uh, these T waves, they appear very prominent but otherwise QRS complexes are narrow. There is no ST depression. This is certainly not VT. This is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, but suddenly at this point, it terminates into physiological state. Now it could be pharmacological cardiac. It could be spontaneous. Many times it just happens without like it gets triggered and it could actually just terminate. So it could be just spontaneous or it may be pharmacological. Maybe patient is treated with adenosine or some other drug, beta blocker, verapamil or some other drug, it cardioverse. It is unlikely to be due to cardioversion because when we deliver cardioversion, there is usually electrical uh, interference here and there is a lot of, uh, and so for some few seconds, ECG just disappears. And that is a feature of cardioversion. So it is most probably spontaneous or pharmacological cardioversion. From here onward, you see the normal, normal, normal P wave. This is a bifid P wave. It's a normal one. QRS T wave, 
PQRS, then everything gets to normal. So just spontaneously or pharmacological, pharmacologically, SVT gets terminated, and this is I think caught on ECG. Now I'm going to explain the mechanism behind this, the mechanism of re-entry. There are two situations. First, we'll take the AV nodal re-entry tachycardia. Okay, I told you the two situation AV nodal re-entry tachycardia and AV atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia. In this case, the re-entry is within the AV node. You, 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 you recognize this structure, right? In this case, it is within the AV node and in this case, it is like using this bundle of Kant. So the re-entry is slightly different. I'll just show you the example. So re-entry is within the node and re-entry involves the bundle of Kant and AV node. Okay. In this case and in this case, it could be both way. It could be this way, this way or it could be this way. Okay. Now let's take the AV nodal tachycardia, AV nodal re-entry. This is the AV node and I'm not sure if you know, but in the AV node, there are two pathways, the fast pathway and slow pathway. This is the atrial side. The atrial current comes here and it passes through both the pathways, that's fast pathway and the slow pathways, both merge with each other on the distant end of the AD node and then continues into the ventricle as a ventricular depolarization current. So this is normal. But a physiological state or an abnormal state may develop where this part, this the fast path is not conducting. It is not conducting this way. Okay. Fast path is just, just imagine theoretically, the fast path is not conducting this way. So the current comes here, it goes through the slow pathway and since this one was not con con conducted this way, it, this current goes backward because this was not depressed, the current goes backward and then comes again and this re-entry cycle develops. And every time the circle develops like this one and every time the current goes this word and this word. Okay. So this is how the supraventricular tachycardia develops within the AV node. The current makes this rounds very, very fast. And with every round, one current is sent to the atria, the other one is sent to the ventricles very fast. Since ventricle depolarization is through the normal pathway, it would be narrow. And since AT depolarization is almost the same time as ventricle, so P wave will be merged into the AV uh, in the QRS complex. So I hope this explains the mechanism of AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. Now uh, this is uh, the other type, AV, re, re, AV uh, atrioventricular reciprocal tachycardia. Now here there are two situations. Uh, there could be two possibilities. One is that the current flows, I mean in both cases, this anomalous pathway, the bundle of Kent will be used and this would be the path of re-entry circle. But it could be this way, any current from atria to the ventricle going through the AV node, anti-grade. This is called anti-grade conduction of the AV node and retrograde conduction of the anomalous pathway. So if th that is the case, or in some cases, in maybe 5-10% of the cases, the anti-grade conduction, the conduction from atria to the ventricle is through the anomalous pathway and retrograde conduction is through the AV node. And they would result in a different type of tachycardias. Both would be AV RTs, but they will, their morphology will be different. Now let me explain. Let's take this example first. So anti-grade conduction, the conduction from the atria to the ventricle is through the AV node. So AV node still has some control on the number of impulses which can be transferred. So there will be tachycardia, not crazy fast, but it would be narrow. You see these are QS complex, they are narrow. Every time a circuit, the, a circuit is completed, current comes to the ventricle and a narrow QS complex because it flows through the normal pathway. But in this case, 
it is otherwise round. The anti-grade conduction comes through the anomalous pathway because anomalous pathway does not have a check mechanism. The basic rhythm is much faster than this one and the complexes are broad. You see these complexes are broad because current comes from this to the ventricles not through the normal conduction system. So these are two um, uh, cases. This is actually uh, I think this is called orthodromic and this is antidromic. Uh, please excuse me if I'm not using the right terminology, orthodromic and antidromic. And this one could be dangerous because this could actually uh, precipitate into ventricular fibrillation. And this is the type and you must have heard that in these SVTs, patient with pre-excitation syndrome with SVTs, you should not give digoxin. And this is that case actually because the joxin would suppress AV conduction and it can make actually the ventriculate even faster. In this case, you can just treat like normal SVT with adenosine, with beta broca, with repamil, with digoxin. But this is the one which should be treated with cardioversion or amiodaron or procainamide. <laughs> So let's sum up some basic facts about paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias. There are two types, AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia and atrioventricular reciprocal tachycardia, usually indistinguishable, but with repeated examination with maybe electrophysiological technique you can differentiate and usually the first line treatment is the same. You just have to be careful in the broad complex type AV reciprocal tachycardia, adenosine, beta blocker, calcium channel blocking agents, digoxin. You can, I think, remember A, B, C, D. One of these agents may be used. Currently, adenosine is the most popular. It is contraindicated in antidromic paroxysmal superventricular tachycardia, the one which is broad complex. DC shock in the refractory cases or unstable cases. DC shock is direct. Electrical cardioversion is very, very effective and it is actually very safe also. Almost universally effective, very safe. But the problem is that when we explain to the family, to the patient that we have to deliver electrical shock, many people become, many people, they become double-minded. They might not give you consent. But those patients who have ischemic chest pain, those patients who are developing hypotension, those patients who are going into shock, those patients who have ST depression, I think DC shock may be life-saving. And you should accordingly explain to the patient. And if, of course, if patient family is not available and patient is not able to give consent, you should assume, you should give yourself a consent because you are saving life, you should give electrical cardioversion. Those patients who have very, very frequent attacks, I think radio frequency ablation. This is a technique. A catheter is passed into the heart and first due to, I mean, with very sophisticated technique, the anomalous pathway is detected. It may be in the AV node or it may be outwhere, outside. And once it is detected, then by delivering high frequency uh, radiation, that anomalous pathway is destroyed. Now, if that succeed, which is the case in 90% in good hands, then patient would not have these attacks in future. So this would be indicated only in those who have very frequent attacks and those who have problematic attacks. So another example, uh, I think this is slightly different. Uh, if you see this lead ECG, in this case also, it is tachycardia, it is narrow, it is regular. But if you see this AVF, you see a notch following every AVF. I showed you another ECG where there was notch, but that notch was very, very close to QRS complex. In fact, something that is called uh, a false R wave. But this is actually very separate. You see, significant, this one, look at this one, significantly after QRS complex, there is a P wave. Okay, so see P waves which follow QRS complex, P waves which follow, here you can see this notch on the upslope of the upslope of the T wave is actually a P wave. 
here you see the P waves, okay? This is junctional tachycardia, the usual type of junctional tachycardia. This picture explains very easy. This is the ectopic focus here. This is the focus and the current, it's a re-entry and current goes this way and this way, both. So if the focus happened to be on the ventricular side, it may be in the, in this case, it may be in the lower part of the AV node or it may be in the upper part of the Hayes bundle. So if you have a pathway, a, a, a focus in the lower part, then ventricles will depolarize first and atria will depolarize later. And there may be actually a, a inverted P wave as you see here. You see, do you appreciate the P wave in AVF is inverted. AVF is like downward. Normal P wave is seen as upright in, in AVF. But since in this case, current is going this way, in normal case, it comes here in this way. So since current is going in the opposite direction, you have inverted P wave. So I think this is a case of junctional tachycardia, very much similar to paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So the criteria PSVT like rhythm, but inverted P wave immediately after QRS, but separate than QRS complex. In other, it was so close that it looked part of the QRS complex. So treatment of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia, just a summary. First, we do carotid massage and those who know that technique, I think it's a very rewarding experience. I recall many patients where we tried and cardioverted, very, very rewarding experience. There is a procedure we need to learn and you have to first auscultate the carotid, then do the procedure, maybe after some sedation. Intravenous adenosine is very effective. Virapamil is effective. Vasoconstrictor drugs used to be given, but not these days. This is also effective. But these vasoconstrictor drugs actually, they would cause hypertension and they would stimulate better receptors and better receptor will suppress sympathetic nervous system, the vasomotor center and the discharge of sympathetic will be reduced, not used anymore. Uh, and I've seen if you use Verapamil or beta blocker and if it does not work uh, and then you repeat carotid massage and then carotid massage might work. So if you have tried carotid massage, didn't work, then you opted to give uh, Verapamil still no response and if you do carotid massage then then that might work and dc shock if there is a stemia or if there is left ventricular failure or if there is a hypotension or any refractory case in ventricular tachycardia this will be discussed separately if patient is stable at that time of presentation maybe you can try iv lignocaine or amiodarone but otherwise dc shock because that is very very uh, effective Treat as VT if in doubt because SVT presenting as broad complex may not be that serious as VT can be. So treat it as VT. So thank you very much for your patient listening. This was a little elaborate but it was interesting. I hope it, you found it interesting. So this was the explanation of a very uh, interesting condition, not very common but condition seen in relatively young people. Uh, SVT, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. I tried to explain two types and I also gave you example of junctional tachycardia. I hope this was helpful. And I'm Professor Aziz Rahman from Madison. I really look forward to see you in my next video and the next one would actually address the pre-excitation syndrome and many of the features would be similar to this one. Thank you very much and see you very soon.